Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's fireside chat. Uh, it's jointly sponsored by Stern Center for Global Economy and Business and the Stern Volatility and Risk Institute. Um, we're honored to have as our guest Gina Smialik to discuss her new book, Limitless. Uh, the Federal Reserve takes on a new age of crisis, which uh, I devoured, and it would encourage you to do the same. Um, and uh, before I introduce Gina, let me do the um, administrative element of this. Uh, we'd like to invite you to participate directly in today's chat uh, by using our audience participation software. So if you go to www.slido.com or you use your phone to uh, take a picture of that, uh, you'll be able to get into the website, enter the number 8294135. I say that once, you can read it up there. Uh, in the join box, you can submit questions, and even more important, you can vote on others' questions. So your votes help us identify uh, which topics are of greatest interest to the audience. So we encourage you to do that. The program will end at 6.02, so it'll be one hour. Uh, and now let me introduce Gina. Uh, Gina is the Federal Reserve reporter for the New York Times, a role that she assumed less than a year before COVID struck. Uh, she also is a regular contributor to Marketplace Radio and Wharton Business Daily, and occasionally contributes to CNN, BBC Radio, C-SPAN, and CBS News in her free time. Prior to the Times, Gina wrote for Bloomberg and Bloomberg Business Week for six years, covering economic policy, the US Treasury, and the ECB. Her feature stories addressed a wide range of topics, ranging from the labor market implications of the opioid crisis to the income distribution impact of elite dating apps. Gina's new book, which is the topic of today's discussion, is currently number one on the bestseller list uh, in money and monetary policy in Amazon. I realize that's a bit of a nerdy category, but then we're all, we're all nerds here, so that, that stands high. Um, in a glowing account of the book, former chief economist of the Obama Council of Economic Advisors, Jason Furman, writes, and I quote, Limitless provides an indispensable, insightful, and compulsively readable guide to the Federal Reserve and its dramatic transformation in recent years, quote. So I'm sure that we're going to have plenty to discuss today. Uh, as a final note, uh, I'm also delighted to share with you that Gina is a recent Stern alum having received her MBA in 2020, I think. And uh, so please join me in warmly welcoming Gina back to Stern. So this is a hometown audience for a hometown journalist. Um, now, I'm just going to kick off with a few questions, but you should please, somewhere around 6, 5.30, I'll take a look and see what we have on Slido and, and turn to the audience. So the title of the book, in case anybody missed it, is Limitless, and it paints a truly compelling picture of a very powerful Federal Reserve that it grew vastly more important over the last 15 years. So the question, the first question I have is the title. Are there really no limits? Yes and no. So the title is a play on something that Chair Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, the leader of the Fed, said at the outset of the coronavirus pandemic. The Fed had started to intervene in markets. It had started to roll out emergency responses to save a bunch of different sort of uh, security classes. And Chair Powell was interviewed at the Brookings Institute shortly after, actually the morning of the unveiling of the bulk of those programs. And the moderator of, of that interview, David Wessel, asked him, you know, is there a limit to how much of this you can do? And he said, no, there is no limit aside from what we are capable of under the law. And so, of course, obviously the back half of that includes a caveat, they can't do anything illegal. But I think that the, the implication there, and I think what he was trying to tell markets and communicate, is that the Fed's ability to sort of pour money into markets in moments of extreme distress is basically unlimited. Their balance sheet capabilities are vast. Um, Obviously, there are limitations. There are some guardrails around what they can do because there are there's legislation around the Fed, and particularly with their emergency powers, they have to set sort of uh, breach a number of hurdles, including has to be an emergency. The Treasury Secretary has to sign off. They have to feel that the any lending they do is secured to their satisfaction. Which is pretty 
budgie limit, but there are some limits, but they're, they're not extensive. And so I thought Limitless was an apt title for the book. Okay. So um, thinking back, obviously there are a lot of ways in which they crossed the Rubicon in, in, in March 2020. But is there, are there one or two that you would pick out as an emblematic of how more powerful and broader their uh, influence became as a result of the crisis? Yeah, so I'm excited to be at Stern because I feel like I can give the nerdy answer to this okay. question. <laughs> um, but I think actually the, the first and perhaps maybe the one with the largest implications is the Fed bought an enormous number of securities right at the outset of the coronavirus pandemic. I think their, their top days were like 100 billion a day in treasury securities, which is just enormous. It, it put to shame QE in its original iterations after 2008. And those purchases were possible partially because the Fed completely shifted its operating regime in between. The Fed now sets interests basically by setting an interest rate and paying it to banks. And, and that's how it guides interest rates into place. It previously had to do open market operations. And so that shift that happened in the post-2008 period really opened the door to being able to do this kind of massive intervention in markets that we hadn't previously seen. And I think we've already seen, and it wasn't just the Fed, it was other central banks around the world doing these kinds of interventions. But I think it opened these questions about, you know, is this just standard operating procedure from here on out? You know, is this what we should expect from the Fed every time there's like a hiccup in the treasury markets? And I don't think we know the answer to that yet because we haven't had another hiccup in the treasury markets, thank, thank goodness, since then. Um, so I think that's the first one that was really interesting and really important. I think the second one that was really interesting to me to watch is they just lent to a wide variety of borrowers that we hadn't seen them touch in 2008. Part of that was clearly a response to 2008. After 2008, you know, there was this very large Occupy movement that often talked about the Fed. There was this real sentiment that the Fed had rescued Wall Street and left Main Street hanging. And so in response to that, they opened up a Main Street lending program for mid-sized businesses. They had a municipal lending facility that sort of helped state and localities continue issuing bonds at reasonable rates. And those things were just, you know, they're much more political, they're much more a la carte, they're much more difficult than what we had historically seen the Fed doing with its emergency powers. And so I think they were really interesting moves. So I think in the book you pointed out that some of those um, specialized interventions actually ran against what the Fed leadership itself had suggested they would be willing to do. Maybe you want to elaborate on that. Yeah, so it was really interesting. In 2019, this topic had actually come up. Rashida Tlaib, who at the time was a freshman Democrat in the House, had during a hearing asked Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, whether it would be possible for the Fed to step in and help municipalities in the next recession. And basically in exactly the context that we're talking about here, she was like, you know, if markets start choking up and we're in a bad place again, why can't the Fed make it cheaper for Detroit to borrow? And he emphatically said that the Fed didn't have that power, nor did it want that power, that this wasn't a thing the Fed was capable of doing, and they wouldn't want to do it because it's just so political. The municipal bond market, for anyone who isn't familiar, is just a very sort of siloed market. Every municipal bond looks pretty different. It's very complicated. And you've got a lot of municipalities using these bonds for various things. And so it's very political. Like you have to design things very carefully in that market. He didn't want to do it. And so it was fascinating to me as a Fed reporter who had been following this conversation, knowing that this was in out there in the ether, that this was something they had been talking about when on April 9th, 2020, they announced that in fact, they were going to jump into this municipal bond market. So, I mean, that's a, it's a great example. And there are others in corporate bonds and, and uh, elsewhere in, in private markets. Um, but the book really emphasizes the, the, the risks that are associated with this kind of broader, more limitless Fed. And particularly in a democratic society where you need to have some kind of elected official involved in oversight of the non-elected officials. So the question, I guess, to you is, how does this affect the Fed's need to be accountable and transparent? Yeah, so I think the Fed itself would say that it makes it much more necessary to be very transparent. They were really careful about releasing a lot of documentation around what they were doing in 2020, um, just because there was so much capability for them to be picking winners and losers. There was a lot of pressure, for example, for them to make that Main Street lending program I talked about earlier friendly to the oil and gas companies. The, the Republicans wanted oil and gas companies to be able to borrow from it. 
Democrats on the other side did not want oil and gas companies included at all, and the Fed had to make some sort of decision there. And, you know, it's sort of a line in the sand. You have to decide one way as the Fed. And I think that was really challenging. I think, you know, that with the municipalities, there was a big effort underway to make the terms friendlier so that certain states and cities could get in. There was a real sort of rush to get that, that th these loans. They weren't actually great loans, but for some people who can't borrow on very good rates, they right. were better than nothing. Um, and there was a real, a real push to have certain localities included. And so I think they tried to answer that with transparency. I think you've also seen them start to talk since about the idea that you don't want to rely on the Fed to do everything. Um, Mary Daly, for example, who's president of the San Francisco Fed, was talking this weekend down at Princeton, and, and this kind of came up. Somebody said something to the effect of, you know, should the Fed be doing, you know, so much? And she made the point that, you know, you don't want to stretch to the Fed too far, and then it can't really focus on its really important goals of maintaining maximum employment and stable inflation, which have sort of been the traditional role we've understood for the Fed. Well, you make the clear point in the book that when the Fed's activities become fiscal-like, they become politicized, and that puts at risk their independence with regard to monetary policy. Are we now at the stage where we have to worry that the Fed's independence is threatened because of these broader powers? I think we're definitely at the stage where we've seen this bubbling up, actually. You know, I think the the book I wrote tries very hard to just be sort of standard reportage in the sense that I'm not taking a huge position in this book. But I do think that we just saw things in 2020 that kind of cut in this direction. And I think there was so much happening in 2020 that it kind of got lost in the general discussion. You know, we were all worried about the shift to remote work or the shift to no work if you lost your job. But there were things happening in the background in Washington that were really interesting. For example, at the end of 2020, when the Trump administration moved to shut down these facilities that we're talking about, the municipal program, Main Street, et cetera, there was some real wrangling on Capitol Hill because there was a belief among some Democrats that if you kept them open under a Democratic administration, you could make the municipal program a lot friendlier to states and localities. It could be a way to shuttle out money if Congress couldn't reach a decision. And I thought that was so interesting because I think that's exactly what we're talking about here is using the Fed's ability to basically print money as a work of you know short-term money. It's a, it's a lent loan. It's not like they're just printing it nilly-willy. But still, their ability to loan this money as a workaround for actual democratic agreements. And I think that's really interesting and something that we probably need to be conscious of. Yeah, there's also the, the problem that every time they get into one of these crises, they have a ratchet effect on the size of their balance sheet. So I was just looking at the numbers. Reserves today are 500 times larger than they were before 2007. Doesn't that put them in a position of being, in some sense, captive, that they, they become fiscal agents because there's no one else to do the job, Congress isn't doing the job, the Treasury doesn't do the job? Is that going to work over time and consistent with their other goals? I think it's a really interesting question. And I actually think we saw a really interesting fire drill around this this fall in England, obviously, not mm -hmm. here yet. Um, but there was this moment when I think the fiscal po fiscal authority in England was making some, had proposed some things that would have blown out the budget that would have increased the deficit there and would have done it in ways that markets were not comfortable with. Markets really reacted. And the Bank of England came in and started buying securities and this looked like the realization of you know, what everyone is worried about, this idea that if you have any kind of financial disruption in the existing world where these big asset purchases have become somewhat normal, that the Bank of England or the Fed or whatever monetary authority you're talking about is going to feel like they have to step in immediately. Like, this is part of their job. They have to do it. But what we saw really interestingly, and I was actually in the room when he, he said it, the Bank of England governor came out and said, we're doing this for three days. You know, we're done. We're done after this week. Figure figure this out. And everyone was unsure whether he was bluffing. I actually it was at the IIF meetings in Washington, the Institution for International Finance meetings in Washington, and the room just went dead silent as soon as he said it. Like nobody knew if he was bluffing or if it was actually going to come to pass. And I mean, it worked. They pressured the government into sort of abandoning, backpedaling away from those plans. And so I think we're at this moment where there is a bit of a tug of war, and we're probably going to continue seeing this play out. And I think, I, think it, I think it's a very interesting moment for that nexus between central banking and fiscal policy. So taking it from the other side, one of the things you point out in the book is that the, in some sense, the, the experience the Fed had in 2007, 2008 became the template for how they dealt with crises later, especially with the pandemic. 
Maybe you want to just explain that a little bit. Yeah, so it was really interesting because in 2007-2008, Ben Bernanke is the chair of the Fed, and he is a Great Depression scholar, and he knew about a lot of powers and capabilities that the Fed had that it had really amassed in the early 1930s and sort of solidified over the years since, but had not used in any meaningful way in the modern era, you know, since we sort of right. think of central banking modern era as starting at like 1951. Since then, hadn't been a major part of the toolkit, and he started using those, those abilities in just pretty fantastic ways in 2008 as things were breaking down and as, as markets were failing. And you know it was supposed to be this once in a lifetime crisis. Everyone thought that we would never touch them again, that this was just sort of this emergency toolkit that probably wasn't going to be part of regular operating procedure in any way. Of course, they did additional research on how they worked. You know, they just in case we needed them again, they kept them sort of in a, a in a, at a state that you might be able to use them in the future. Um, but I don't think anyone expected that. And then 2020 hits, and we brought them all back out. And not only did we bring them all back out, but we built on a lot of them. In a matter of days and weeks. In a matter of days and weeks. Right. Some of that was quite challenging, actually, if you talk to anyone who worked on the money market fund program. Well, you put program. that out. You, know, <laughs> you, know, you brought it home in the book, because you reminded, I mean, we forget, but this was happening in the early days of COVID. Yeah. And they weren't in the office. So they had to actually figure out how to do all these immense actions without anybody in the, being in the same room at the same time. I, maybe you want to describe that. Yeah, it was really interesting. They were doing, you know, some of the critical core people were did still come in for some of it, but then a lot of them went home. And so, you know, Chair Powell, for example, was working from his house in Chevy Chase for quite a bit of this. Um, the Treasury stayed in office pretty much the entire time, which I always found really interesting. But a lot of the- a It's lot a big of, building. It is a big building, <laughs> I guess. Uh, there was a thin staff as well. So <laughs> big building, thin staff. Uh, but yeah, so it was you know this real like shift to remote work simultaneous with this crazy project of trying to set up all these facilities. People are working through the night. People are, you know, the people who are going in are sleeping in the office. It was, it was very, very hairy, harried for a while there. Um, and a lot of the work was done over the weekend because they were trying to get things out before markets opened. Um, and so it was just sort of an all hands on deck effort. And it's funny because if you uh, read the phone logs that they keep for Chair Powell, the, the visitor logs, where he sort of keeps his calendar, uh, they typically have some amount of detail to them. You know, like they will tell you who he met with at every stage of the day. For the entire pandemic period, it just says various meetings because they completely lost track. Like they forgot in the rush to keep track of who he was talking to and just like decided they couldn't back back create it because the, it would Understood. take forever. And so I thought that I thought that was an interesting, you know, little hint at how crazy things were. Logistics must have been night, a nightmare. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was absolutely nuts. You can see Secretary Mnuchin did keep track of everyone he was talking to during this period because among his other qualities, he's very punctilious. He keeps, he's a very, very detail-oriented person. Um, and he had like calls that were like two minutes. Like it would be like two minute call with Jay Powell, two minute call with Chuck Schumer, two minute call with Mitch McConnell. It was, it was just absolutely nuts the number of calls this man was doing in a day. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna ask you to put on your, your forecasting hat and tell us, given the experience the Fed's had in 2008 and 2020, what does that tell us about the next time they have a financial crisis? Well, it's really interesting because I think we already know that they know that it's entirely possible they're gonna to have to use these tools again. And we know that both because of things I've reported and things I've reported in this book and also because of things they've said out loud. So Lori Logan, who's president of the Dallas Fed now but was sort of in the New York Fed's most important markets facing role during this period, gave a speech the other day where she basically laid out a logic for how she thinks these tools should be used in the future, especially when it comes to quantitative easing and bond buying. Um, so we know they think they're going to use that again. I mean, it's just kind of become, we used to call them extraordinary, but they're kind of just ordinary now. I think these are part of the regular toolkit. Um, and then when it comes to the you know, emergency backstop measures. I think it's really interesting. I, I note in the book that they actually perfected the municipal, municipal liquidity program after it shut down. Like they kept doing research on how to make it usable and, and better and less likely to pick winners and losers. And I think that's a pretty clear signal that they expect that they might have to use that again in the future. So there are other central banks that have gone even further. And the Bank of Japan has invested in um, real estate investment trusts and in directly in the equity market and ETFs. 
Is the Fed headed there the next time? So this is where we actually aren't limitless. The Fed actually is quite limited in what it can buy through outright asset purchases. So some of the things, some of the more creative things we've seen other central bankers do, like buy equities or buy REITs or buy really anything that looks like an equity, smells like an equity, quacks like an equity, um, and corporate bonds, you cannot buy them outright, outright under the Federal Reserve Act. You have to buy government-backed securities. Um, and so it seems unlikely that they could do that with their current legal backing. That said, I think we saw in 2008 and afterward, there was this real feeling that you did not want to touch the Federal Reserve Act, that you did not want to change anything legally around what the Fed could do here. And that was almost gospel. When I started covering the Fed, that was just, you knew you, you could almost pre-write the answers when somebody got asked about this, because you knew they were going to say like, nope, we don't want that power, we don't need that power, absolutely not. At 2020, in 2020, at the outset of the coronavirus pandemic, Janet Yellen and Ben Bernanke, the two most former, most immediate former Fed chairs, wrote, co-authored a, um, a column, I believe, in the FT, where they basically said, you should change the Federal Reserve Act to allow them to buy corporates. Um, and so I think that two people of that sort of weight and seriousness suggesting that the Fed should be allowed to buy corporate bonds is probably something that is going to bubble up again in the future. You know, I think that was that sent a signal to me that I feel like it was a unique circumstance, the pandemic. It was wild. We all hope it never happens again. But you know, markets are fragile, markets are complex and interconnected. In the event of another major shock, I think you'll see some sort of movement toward toward at least asking the question, should this be a legal ability? So, so that makes me just think that the deeper they go down this path, the more likely it is that someone on Capitol Hill is going to be unhappy. Um, whether it's the people who want them to buy municipals or the people who want them to buy oil and gas debt or the people who don't want them to buy oil and gas debt, someone's going to be a loser. They can't make everybody happy. And that raises serious questions about whether they're going to be able to do their primary task of keeping the economy stable and prices stable. So I, I, the more I listen to this, the more I think this is just not sustainable. Um, I don't know if you would agree. Well, it's interesting because it's certainly the case that throughout the Fed's entire history, they've made people on Capitol Hill unhappy, right? You know, I think Paul Volcker just got absolutely raked over the coals every time he ever testified. Yeah. Um, and so I don't think that's entirely new. I think the sort of accusations of potential partisanship could potentially be new. And I don't know, I think it's really hard to game out what the end result of that would be. It could just be the case that you know, congressional leaders kind of yell at the Fed and they can't do anything, and so it doesn't actually matter at the end of the day. But it could be the case, you know, I think the, the sort of Rubicon the Fed's always afraid of crossing is that there will be enough disagree or enough agreement that something's gone awry at the Fed that lawmakers will actually reopen the Federal Reserve Act and that you could impair that independence, that sort of precious ability to set monetary policy outside of the partisan process in some way. And so I think that's always going to be a concern. Again, I don't. I do not feel like a sophisticated enough political tea leaf reader to predict whether that's likely. That's fine. Actually, since we're talking about partisanship, one of the interesting parts of the book is the, the point you make about the difference between the way monetary policy is pursued and the way regulatory and financial, financial regulatory policy is pursued. And in the latter case, you highlight that it is actually quite partisan, even inside the Fed. Maybe you want to describe that. Yeah, and I think this is maybe not the most novel observation in the world, but I think it's an interesting one in a world where these policies are increasingly overlapping, where you know financial vulnerabilities and what you have to do with monetary policy are definitely on the same Venn diagram. Um, but in the way that we treat monetary policy versus financial policy at the, or financial stability policy at the Fed is extremely different. Um, we've always kind of treated regulatory policy as partisan pursuit. It's extremely political. There's just kind of no way around that. You know, typically in America, the way we see that play out is Republicans are more sort of pro-free market, less pro-regulation. Democrats are more pro-regulation. And so the way that manifests at the Fed is the vice chair for supervision, the sort of like chief of uh, financial supervision policy and financial regulation policy for the big bank holding companies that the Fed regulates tends to be a fairly partisan appointment. Um, still has to be committed. Uh, confirmed by the Senate, so that does mean sort of drag them to the middle a little bit. But they tend to kind of pursue a semi-partisan approach to how they think about bank supervision and regulation. Randy Quarles, who is the first vice chair for supervision, it was a recently created job by Dodd-Frank, he was, um, he's a major character in the book. He really, I think, would not 
object to me characterizing it this way. He really sort of worked on fine-tuning regulations, trying to scale them back a little bit. He, he talked a lot about like maintaining the safety at the core of the system, but he definitely made tweaks that all hit went in one direction, which was towards lighter regulation. Um, he really tried to make supervision a lot more predictable, which if you talk to most Democrats, translates to worse, <laughs> because when supervision is predictable, it's easier to game. Um, most Republicans would say when you make things predictable, it allows people to lend and not be nervous that they're going to you know, get dinged for it. Um, but I think that that was clearly the push there. I think we now have uh, Vice Chair Michael Barr as uh, the Vice Chair for Supervision. And I often think of him as sort of you know, the most dangerous nerd in Washington. Everyone's terrified of this man. Um, Why is he's, that? He's, well, so he's got a really interesting approach to bank regulation. He's, he's kind of doing this big review of whether capital is high enough. Um, I shouldn't say most dangerous man in Washington, scariest man in Washington. The banks are terrified of him. Um, and it's, it's so interesting. There's this big bank lobbying push underway right now, preemptively, before the results of this review are even out, because they're all fairly convinced that they're, he's going to call for substantially higher bank capital. Um, their line is sort of, you know, capital isn't costless. His line is capital is maybe not high enough to be safe. Um, and so I think we have seen this real swing. It's a shift in the pendulum. I would say that he's almost sort of like Ian to Randy Quarles is Yang. They're, they're pretty much pursuing, you know, not, not, neither of them, neither, no one would look at either of them and say this person doesn't know what they're doing or like this person isn't qualified or this person's just a partisan hack. They're both relatively moderate relative to the parties, but they're both clearly coming at it from some sort of ideological bent. Um, and so that's very different from monetary policy, where we see people really try and separate out from whatever their partisanship is. You know, we, it is the case that sometimes Democrats are more dovish, meaning they favor lower policy, and Republicans are more hawkish, meaning they favor tighter policy. But I actually don't think, I've, you know, I've been watching these people for a long time. I don't think that maps as cleanly as people often think it does. You know, you get, you get people who have much more complicated views on monetary policy than that. The partisanship, just the lines are not that clear. And the lines are never really framed in a partisan way either. You know, there's this real feeling that policymaking when it comes to sort of economic management should be very apolitical. Actually, you make the point in the book um, in highlighting some of the issues that become politicized, for example, income e inequality issues that become politicized. You make the point that, that especially from the point of view of monetary policy, there are a lot, there's a lot of shades of gray, that it's not all black and white. Maybe you want to explain why and how that affects the way the Fed behaves and with regard to monetary policy. Yeah, I think income inequality has been a really interesting thing to watch at the Fed because when I started covering the Fed, which like not to hugely date myself, was back in 2013, they didn't talk about it. It was seen as a very Democrat sort of side of the aisle topic. You didn't want to be seen as a monetary policymaker talking about it in any really strident term because it looked like you were aligning yourself with the left. And so they didn't talk about it at all and they avoided it really aggressively. And then I think over the years we got to this point where income inequality had become such a dominant feature of the economic discussion, the academic economic discussion, and all of our understanding of how sort of macroeconomics works in the 21st century, that they almost couldn't not talk about it. You know, you can't, you can't talk about an economic assessment, make a reasonable economic assessment of sort of how the labor market's playing out in the post-2008 era without talking about inequality. And so we saw them start to, in very academic terms, talk about inequality. They faced a lot of pushback for that. Uh, Janet Yellen gave a speech about opportunities um, back in, I, I want to say it was 2015. Um, and she just got absolutely harangued about that when she testified before Congress. Um, Mick Mulvaney accused her of putting her nose in places that she had no business putting her nose in. Um, and it was really, it was really tense for a while. Um, but I think we've seen them really start to say, you know, this is such an important topic that we just can't ignore it. And so despite that political backlash, they continue to sort of slowly persevere on and doing research about inequality. Now some of the, you know, the Minneapolis Fed has an opportunity for inclusive growth center that basically just studies inequality all the time. San Francisco Fed re regularly does conferences on this. It appears in all of the Fed's major annual reports. You know, inequality is like sort of common fare now for them to talk about. I think that's partially because there's more partisan consensus around it being an important issue. Issue, but I think it's also partially because sometimes an issue is so important to the economy that they decide that whether it has a partisan lean or not, you just have to talk about it. Okay. Um, I promised I would look to see if there are any questions from the uh, audience. Did you want to put, uh, Venky's going to put the questions up, and the one that has the most votes 
right now at the top is one from Venki. I'm sure he's, <laughs> you did not vote for your own <laughs> it's question, I hope. Um, so I'm going to use this one. Um, have the Fed's past unconventional responses, we're going to call them now standard monetary policy toolkit responses, <laughs> uh, have their past responses to stress in asset markets made its current task of tightening financial conditions more difficult? Yeah, starting with an easy one. So yeah. that's, that's good. <laughs> but you're at Stern. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, I mean, I think it matters how you define financial conditions and also how you define harder. Uh, but I think, I think there's, there's, like, you could write a doctoral thesis on this topic, basically. But I do think that it's definitely the case that some of the changes in market structure have made tightening financial conditions more difficult. And I think that's because it's just very difficult. I mean, the Fed is currently trying to run down its balance sheet. It is that is continuing apace. It's going fairly well. But I think everyone knows that there's probably some end point there that they can't go beyond. You know, there is a, a level of QT that you can't pass without making markets go absolutely nuts. And we're all kind of trying to figure out what the X data is. And I don't think there's like a clear understanding of that. Uh, most people think it's still pretty far away. But back in 2019, they went too far. Reserves in the system got too low. And money market dysfunction was pretty painful. And they had to restart asset purchases. Um, and I think it's really difficult to sometimes, in, in that instance, I think they did an OK job. They used repos pretty aggressively. But I think that it's sometimes difficult to distinguish what is an asset purchase for market functioning reasons and what is an asset purchase that's easing financial conditions. You did see financial conditions ease a little bit in that 2019 episode. Um, and so I do think that some of the market structure changes that have happened have made it a lot harder to just you know cleanly tighten financial conditions. Um, I think that whether those are the actual out, outgrowth of unconventional monetary policy is somewhat complicated, right? Because to some degree, it's like the treasury market structure has just gotten much more complicated. A lot of intermediation happens outside of the traditional primary dealers and banking system. Um, and the treasury market itself is just enormous, right? And so I think you know, in the 2019 episode, I think that intermediation issue was a lot of the problem. So I don't know if I'm going to just interpret what you were saying. Unless you go ahead, Vicky, if you want to go ahead and ask. No, go ahead. No, no. Well, I was, I, I, I was interpreting what you were saying as you were. They're cutting off the left tail of bad outcomes, mm -hmm. and by doing that, they're making it more difficult for, uh, for people to, to to essentially to price risk. They're pricing it as if that left tail would never occur. I think that's what you were sort of asking. Is that yeah. what you're getting at? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean. Uh, Far be it for me to comment on this too authoritatively as a journalist. That's certainly what economists will tell you. And I think it's what careful mar market watchers will tell you. Um, I think the money market mutual funds is actually kind of a, a nice example here. Like Money market mutual funds clearly operate as though there's no risk of failure at some level, um, because there is no risk of failure at some level. And the reason that there is no risk of failure at some level is because the Fed has stepped in twice to save them. Um, so I think, I mean, I think that's probably true. Um, actually, it relates to the next question that's up there. I was going to ask you about, you know, is the Fed a slave to financial markets? But the question, the, the one that's a little bit more specific, uh, says, uh, how important is the stock market response for the Fed? Has this changed with quantitative easing after 2008? Yeah, I think this is such a nuanced question, actually, because I think that there's, like, this very simplistic view of this, which is that like markets rule the Fed, the Fed doesn't want to disrupt markets, this is all they care about, they're never going to do something that disrupts the stock market, you know, the, that's the end of the story. I actually think it's much more complicated than that. I think it actually owes a lot to sort of a shift in the macroeconomic thinking around monetary policy implementation that I think Ben Bernanke really sort of brought to the fore. So Dr. Bernanke, many of you are probably familiar with this to some degree, really has this belief that a lot of monetary policy operates through expectations channels. Pretty common in the literature. I don't think it was as widely accepted at the Fed before his tenure. Um, and so I think those expectations channels basically mean financial markets at some level. You know, when we're talking about financial conditions in a Feddy way, we're kind of talking about something that approximates, in my mind, the Goldman Sachs financial, uh, financial why can't I come up with the word, conditions index. Um, and that that is heavily sort of asset prices. That's what we're talking about. And so I think that when they are thinking about whether policy is moving in the right direction, whether they're implementing things properly, they are thinking about what's happening in the equity market, what's happening in mortgage markets, what's happening in some of these key markets that they think are important for transmission of their monetary policy. And to that extent, I think that they are watching markets very closely. 
I don't think the, I mean, clearly we spend a lot of time talking about the Fed put in finance. Um, I don't think that's really that new. Um, I don't think, you know, the Fed has a financial stability mandate. You get like huge swings across asset classes that end up being disorderly to the extent that they think something is about to be disorderly. I do think that you've traditionally seen them try to make sure it's not disorderly. They don't want, they don't want liquidity provision to dry up and cause a financial crisis. This is sort of like bread and butter Fed 101. You know, they were set up in 1913 specifically to avoid runs on banks. And I think at some level you have to just see the entire marketplace now as, as this sort of giant bank that they, they kind of think about when they're, when they're thinking about that financial stability each part of their job. So that actually gets back, I'm going to intervene with one more, um, to what we were talking about earlier that regulatory policy can be partisan. But the Fed's regulation authority is usually focused on banks, and yet most of the problems we've seen in the crises of 2008 and in 2020 came from non-banks. Mm -hmm. So if you were to make regulatory policy regarding banks somehow stricter, um, isn't that just going to shift the systemic risk to non-banks? Banks will absolutely tell you that. But no, I think, I think we've clearly seen that. That has clearly been the case. I think there are some people who would argue, I don't think there are, there are some people who would argue that actually that's a good thing. We have siloed off the risk. It's much better if it's not in the banking system. You don't want it to take down the banking system every time something goes wrong. And being siloed can have its benefits. I mean, I think we really saw this with the crypto blow up recently. The crypto community is very siloed. It blew up and it really didn't hit the rest of the financial system. You know, nobody nobody had problems outside of crypto really in Silvergate, I guess. But so shouldn't the Federal Reserve want the act rewritten so that they have some authority over non banks? Well, so I think I think the interesting question is the non banks that are systemic unlike crypto. So I think we sometimes think of banks as the only thing in the economy that is systemic, and I think that we've regularly had to bail out actors that aren't banks that clearly you know, did have some important function in the markets. Um, I think of in 2020, you know, money market mutual funds, when they're mm -hmm. crashing, you really need them. They're really important sort of providers of liquidity in money markets. I just call obviously. them banks. They have a different legal name. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, and like, you know, regular people have deposits at them. And so you can't just let them crash. I think, you know, I think we really saw this very clearly. It was really interesting to watch the Fed's attempts to stem the bleeding in the treasury market, obviously the most important market in the world, um, in 2020. And a lot of that tied back to the breakdown of a hedge fund basis trade that we knew existed, we knew was risky. And, you know, it, it, the intermediation in treasuries is just so different. So much of it happens in places like that. A lot of it was foreign funds holding holding, and then dumping treasuries. And so, you know, there are these, these pockets of vulnerability that are completely outside of the Fed's control. Um, I'm not sure that the Fed wants them under their control, but I do think there's this idea that you need some sort of very organized, very, you know, sort of swimming in the same direction kind of regulatory apparatus if you're going to have all of these risks out there. And I will say a lot of regulation and a lot of regulatory rethinking is happening right now. Um, for example, with that hedge fund trade I just talked about, there's a push to enhance form PF, which is where the form that tells us details about what hedge funds are holding, not very detailed right now. And there's a push to make it much more detailed so we can see the risks in the system and know where they are. That's um, coming from the SEC, presumably, right? SEC and CFTC. Right. Um, and then there's a push from the SEC to reform money market mutual funds. That's a dicey problem. No one's most people I talk to aren't super confident that's going to work out great, but you know I do think I do think we're seeing some action in this area. Okay, um, so, going I, back to oh Steve, go ahead. Comment, uh, and it's something we should have announced earlier. Anonymous questions. Yeah, as far as possible, I mean, you know, we wanted to impose that everybody puts their name in. I think it's just bad practice to have anonymous questions up there. There's nothing in the software that allowed me to make it a mandatory fund, but I should have announced it earlier. So if some, whoever posts the question, if you want to take ownership of the question, then we can, we can kind of ask that. I think it's just bad practice to have anonymous questions. Um, so the first non-anonymous question on the list uh, is from Professor Wachtel. I don't think he's here. Um, does the Fed have any responsibilities with regard to climate change? Has policy making been affected by such concerns? And should it be? I know the last part of it is the part you, as a journalist, don't usually like to address. Yeah, I'm not going to address that. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I will address the rest of the question right. because I think that there are pretty clear answers to this. The Fed has decided that its responsibility as far as climate goes is basically to make sure that the banking system is conscious of its own climate risks. 
Um, and so they are introducing climate scenarios into their stress testing. They're not binding on capital. They don't require more capital. But the point is basically to make banks run some sort of tabletop exercise that tells them where their exposures are very difficult to design this stuff so it's very much in its sort of iterative phases and I don't think we have like a real feel for how it's going to play out. The banks will tell you that they already do this, that they're very aware of their climate risks, but it does seem like the Fed is trying to sort of get those muscles ready at any rate um, and so that's where we, we're seeing them take action now. There's a lot of pressure on the Fed to be more sort of proactive about this to either think about tying some sort of capital standard to it or to even think about you know what they could do as far as climate goes. There's been pressure in other economies to do things like green QE, um, where you either don't buy the assets of sort of bad environmental actors or do buy the assets of people who are going to help finance the climate transition. Uh, zero appetite for that here right now, like none at all to my to my knowledge um, within the actual policy making halls. But it definitely is an open conversation. I don't think this is going anywhere. I think this is work sort of at the early innings of this one uh, and it, it's going to develop over the next couple of years. Um, you pointed out in the book that uh, Chair Powell, um, before he became a governor, was deeply involved in uh, the um, debt limit crisis of 2011. So presumably that gives him some uh, advantage in the current environment. Uh, how does the Fed plan to manage if things don't go smoothly over in Congress uh, in raising the debt ceiling? So the Fed would tell you things must go smoothly with ra raising the debt ceiling and we are absolutely not going to talk about this because I think that there's a real feeling that if the Fed makes it seem like there is anything they can do to stop what they say would be an unmitigated disaster, you know, if we were to actually default on the nation's debt, that it will make it more likely that that default happens. And so they will not lay out any kind of playbook. We do know from past debt episodes, debt ceiling episodes, that there is some playbook. You know, they have, because the Fed is the sort of executor of the Treasury, it's, it's the Treasury's banker, basically. And so it's pretty clear that the Fed has laid out some sort of plan for how it would continue carrying out that function as banker to the Treasury and how it could potentially try and mitigate the fallout in markets where we had a default on the debt. That's things like taking on defaulted bonds as collateral, you know, maybe buying some defaulted bonds. I think they think of that as very much like a band-aid on a bullet hole kind of solutions. You can tell from the transcripts at the time, when, which are kind of funny actually, because it's pretty clear from the transcripts in 2013 that they thought that those transcripts were going to be like a historical artifact, that we would be done having this conversation by the time the transcripts came out five years after that. And instead, here we are. Um, but I think that the, uh, the upshot is they can do some things. They don't really, I don't think anyone seriously thinks that they would actually be a game changer if push came to shove. Got it. Um, let me ask a question about strategy. And I'm sure this comes up often. We have just recently experienced the highest inflation in 40 years. It's coming down. But it's certainly something the Fed didn't want. And yet, when they changed their strategy in 2020, they clearly gave up some form of preemption. They decided that they were not going to respond, simply to respond to a tight labor market unless they actually had a pickup in inflation. And yet, even when they had the pickup in inflation, they failed initially to respond. Is it driven by the strategy? Was it just a mistaken understanding? Was it a uh, bad uh, interpretation of the economy that they were facing? Yeah, so I will say, and I think some of them would say, have said, um, that it was not necessarily driven by the actual strategy change that they made in 2020, the sort of you know big sort of constitutional statement change that they made about how they were going to go about making monetary policy, it probably was driven at least partially by the implementation of that strategy. So in August of 2020, we heard the Fed basically say that they were not they were no longer going to raise interest rates just because unemployment was too low because they didn't feel that they could any longer assess accurately how low was too low. It was just very difficult to guess what kind of low unemployment rate would actually generate higher inflation. And so they basically sort of said that they weren't going to do that anymore. Uh, and they implemented that policy in September 2020 by saying that they weren't going to change policy until inflation was at 2% and likely to exceed it, and the economy had returned to maximum employment. And being the operative sentence there, you know, like they, they very much tied themselves An inclusive to the end. 
was an inclusive right. end, yeah. yeah. Um, and it, so they very, I think, I think that that was the kind of policy that really ties you to the mast. You cannot get away from it without losing your credibility. And they also very clearly guided what they were going to do with asset purchases and what the sequence was going to be for moving away from asset purchases and moving towards higher interest rates. All of that kind of like came back to bite them in 2021 because we saw the inflation pop up. I think they took them a while to get nervous about it. They thought it was transitory. Bad word now. But they thought it was transitory. So they thought the inflation was going to go away. It didn't. But by the time that they realized it wasn't going to go away, it took them a long time to move away from asset purchases, to go through their whole sequence of sort of stopping that process, and then move towards rate increases. They'll say that they're relatively nimble, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, the ticker shows that it took, you know, there was a good five month chunk there kind of between when they started to realize things were going awry and when they finally managed to actually raise interest rates. And so I think that did have them fighting on a back foot a little bit. They had to move really fast in 2022. It doesn't seem to have broken anything yet. In fact, it seems like the economy might be re-accelerating. Re so, you know, I feel like the end of this chapter is not yet written, but I think that's sort of the sequence we're playing with at this stage. So that actually brings up another question that's related to this. Um, there have been people out there, including one of the positive reviewers of your book, Jason Furman, who have been suggesting that it would be really costly for the Fed to try to lower inflation down to 2% and they should simply raise the target. Um, I haven't heard that from any, any Fed official. Um, be interested to hear what your thoughts are and what you hear in, in, in speaking with people at the Fed. Yeah, so I would say that there's an emphatic no here. Like, absolutely not. They have zero interest in raising the inflation target. And the reason for that is I think they are real students of the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s experience. And what happened back then is in the 70s, we saw inflation take off. Everyone knew inflation was a problem. The Fed did react. You know, they raised interest rates. But every time unemployment shot up, they would be like, ah, you know, inflation's not so bad. We'll just go ahead and cut them again. And I think that the Fed learned and like integrated into its soul as an institution that that, is, that sort of stop and start policy, that that acceptance of somewhat higher inflation is really where you get into trouble. Like that, They think that that is what allowed inflation to stay high for so long. They think it's why when you had the oil embargoes and some other problems in the early 1980s, inflation shot up to double digit levels and Paul Volcker had to really sort of bring the cudgel down and hurt the economy really, really badly in order to get inflation under control. So we have zero interest in re repeating that experience. And so I think because that is sort of the gospel at the Fed, there's also zero interest in raising that inflation target. They think they would cede their credibility. So they will occasionally say, you know, this could potentially be a longer term conversation. It is not the conversation now. So, um, but they haven't yet gotten to the point where they've really faced the political pressure from what they're doing mm. because unemployment is still at 40 year lows, 50 year lows. So what happens, let's say six to 12 months from now, if unemployment's rising, notably, inflation is still stuck above their target and they're saying that they're really committed to getting down to 2%. What happens both to their commitment and to the political pressures that they face? I think nobody can actually know the answer to this question at any level of confidence. I will say I wrote a story about this, I guess late last year now, um, it's just kind of you know talking to people who know the main characters that we're talking about here, just kind of trying to tease out what they thought was likely to happen. And the thing I heard again and again is, if you are a central banker at the Fed right now, you know that this is about your legacy. You know, short-term political pressure, bad. Like, nobody likes being the bad guy. Nobody wants to be the person the president is potentially tweeting about. You know, it's not, a, it's not a pleasant thing to have happen to you. That said, it's way worse to be the guy who let inflation get completely out of control and stay that way. And it's immensely worse to be seen as someone who did that because of political pressure. And, you know, again, we have an example of this from the 1970s. You know, Arthur Burns, who was the Fed chair under the Nixon administration, based on the, you know, the tapes, seems to have pretty clearly bent to pressure from the administration to keep rates super low, let inflation take off, and his name is like a swear word in central banking circles. You know, it's, I, there is some amount of like reputational rehabilitation happening right now for him, but I feel like, you know, it's not doing a great job. Not among PhD economists. 
what Ben Bernanke's book has a little bit of a, like a retelling of the Burns story, but his most recent one. But I think in general, people still treat him as very much the worst central banker of all time, basically in in America. And so I think that there's no no interest in being. He has competition Arthur on that front, but there but it's 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 a close call. Um, the um, you know one of one of the great features of the book, which is great for me because I don't spend much time thinking about the personality issues on the Fed. The book is full of really wonderful um, biographies of key Fed officials, people like Mariner Eccles, Eccles excuse me, um, Paul Volcker, Janet Yellen, Jay Powell, uh, Lil Brainerd. Um, but the question that I wanted to get at is, knowing what you know about these personalities, how does it really affect their policy decisions and their skill at making getting policy done in the way that they think best? Yeah, well, I think the fact that the Fed is a very consensus-driven institution means that your personality at an institution like that actually matters for policy success. Um, and so I think that's one of the reasons I chose, well, partially I chose to dwell on the personalities because they're just interesting and it makes it a more fun read, I hope. Um, it does. Part, <laughs> partially I chose to dwell on it because I think, I think it does matter to the policy. You know, I think Chair Powell, for example, is somebody who is particularly good at generating a consensus when he needs to. He's very good at sort of, you know, like calling every single human being who could be relevant to a decision point and making sure they come around to his side of, you know, the story. Um, and so that was, I think, very important in sort of getting the framework review through that we just talked about in 2020. I think it was very important to some of the things they did very early in 2020. Um, you know, I think those personality matters actually do end up having some bearing on how things get done. Well, you, you, you make that point that there is an interesting question that arises from it. And this has been one of the most extraordinary um, macroeconomic periods of my lifetime, where we've had um, the threat of a depression relating to COVID. We've suddenly had the highest inflation in 40 years. The uncertainty levels are extraordinarily high. You can see it in the summary of economic pro uh, uh, projections that the Fed publishes, always at record uncertainty levels on their, their own projections. So how is it that Jay Powell's able, able to get such consensus? Because in the past, we used to have far more frequent uh, dissents, from, especially from Federal Reserve Bank presidents. It's remarkable to me that there have been so few. Yeah, it's interesting. I really do think there was sort of like a sense of team spirit around the pandemic era. You know, you didn't want to be dissenting during the middle of a massive crisis. So at least from my reporting at that point, I think even when people disagreed, which there was some disagreement under the surface, there was this real feeling that like you're not going to dissent, you know, in this environment. I think that we might be at the point where that's like about to start cracking to some degree. Um, you do hear people voicing some pretty different views and you're seeing them make those views known. And I don't think we're at the point that they're ready to dissent yet, but like in the last minutes, for example, it was very clear that several several officials would have preferred a bigger rate increase in January and lost that argument. But they weren't voting. But they weren't, well, actually I think one of them might have been, but okay. yeah, but I, I but they, they clearly came around to the consensus, yeah. And so I think, I think that is interesting that we, um, that we've seen that sort of shift. But would you say because of his consensus building skills that Jay Powell is a more powerful chair than his predecessors have been? Well, it's interesting because I would say that Janet Yellen was also a consensus builder. Um, she didn't have an era that required as much like huge disagreement as this one has. I think policy, the policy path was just a little bit clearer during that period. And so we didn't necessarily see her flexing those muscles in the same way, I don't think. Um, Chair Bernanke had a much more unruly committee, I would say. He, like, there were some really big personalities when he was he was Fed chair, and we did see a lot of dissents during that, that era. Um, I think that might owe to sort of the shift in composition as opposed to some, some sort of like difference, in, huge difference in personality. Although, you know, I will say Chair Bernanke also had a, like, and, and he's clear about this in his books, he had a, often a very sort of clear idea about what they were going to do with policy that sometimes sort of predated the actual conversation about that. And I don't think that was always appreciated on the committee. Um, but, you know, I think he learned, he learned over the course of his chairmanship to, to come to the committee first. Okay. Um, let me ask one more question from the, the list here. Um, Can we make a decision? 
Oh yeah, the please. Who asked that. I would love to hear her answer on the CBDC question. So oh, we're even gonna so we're going to pretend that we know who the anonymous person is. The person who asked the CBDC question want to think there we go. Okay, <laughs> that's Mathieu, who's who's uh, actually was participating this year in uh, for representing NYU in the Fed Challenge. So, oh, nice, uh, so, very cool. Um, so now we can ask it. Um, so, central bank digital currencies. What do you see as the response of the Fed and Congress if China issued an international central bank digital currency? Yeah, so I ask a lot of people about this, and I don't actually think anybody cares, um, which is like bad but true. Like I think there's this real idea that the digital yuan would not be seen as an, a realistic competitor for the existing reserve currencies just because there aren't sort of the safety mechanisms around it that we see with a traditional reserve currency. It's basically the same reason that the renminbi has always struggled to compete in global markets as a reserve currency. There's this belief that there's a degree of state control that people just aren't comfortable with and sort of state oversight. And so I think there's this feeling that like, yes, it would be maybe concerned. I, I think the, to the extent that people are concerned about it, it's that the technical prowess would be there, that you know China would clearly have figured something out that we haven't figured out at a technical level, but I don't think there's a real feeling that a digital renminbi would just supplant other reserve currencies in global markets. Um, I was going to suggest that they might have been more worried about stable coins had crypto not collapsed. Um, so China, I, yeah. I do think there's actually real concern about private sector stable coins. Right. Like, I don't, I don't think there's no concern about digital currency, period. I think there's specifically, because of the sort of geopolitical reasons I just listed, less concern about the yuan. But I think there, there is definitely that, like, extremely, you know, they, they are actively studying this stuff. They're actively trying to think about how the U.S. could both technic from a technical standpoint and also from a legal standpoint, because it's much more challenging here, do some sort of CBDC just in case that's necessary, specifically because of the stablecoin issue. Did you want to follow up, Mathieu? Any? Uh, no. Uh, mm, sorry, my question mostly came because of the announcement I saw yesterday, um, just last week, I think, that the, the Fed was going to do research more on CBDC, so that's also why we yeah, and there's the Treasury Working Group under, which is prob probably the announcement you saw last week, um, under the Biden administration is, because this, this has to be a joint project, basically, because they, there's some legal ambiguity here, but they've basically determined, they think that you would need some sort of act of Congress to set up a CBDC, um, but they're trying to figure out what the technical rails would be and basically how you would structure it and whether it would be sort of in tandem with the private sector, like if the private sector would be involved in some way. So there are a lot of outstanding questions they're working on pretty, pretty rapidly at this stage. So one of the things you just do in the book by painting these portraits of people who are active at the Fed, you highlight some of the different skill sets that they bring to the Fed. So if you looked at the FOMC today and said, gee, here are the skill sets that we don't see at the FOMC, what do you think's missing? Mm, that's a really interesting question. I think one thing that we, so Lael Brainerd, the vice chair, former vice chair, major character in this book, has just moved over to the White House. Mm -hmm. um, she was, a really good diplomat. Like she was good, and I'm I'm not saying this in a biased way. I'm saying this like based she's on an extensive diplomat. reporting from over the years. She's good at negotiating, um, right. and so and she was very. She had a ton of experience in in international circles, doing international negotiations. Right. She was a Sherpa during the Clinton administration. Um, some people absolutely hate the things she achieved with her negotiations. I am like not ruling on that in any way. Some people think she's great. Some people hate her. You know, it's, that's not my job. Um, but I do think that that's a skill set that we don't have. That that experience is no longer there. You know, she she took it with her. Lisa Cook, who's one of the new governors, does have quite a bit of international background. She actually studied Russia for her doctoral. Th ironically, credit provision in Russia was her doctoral thesis. Um, so kind of like you know news you can use these days. Um, but she doesn't have the same sort of negotiating background. Aside from Chair Powell himself, who brings financial market experience to the FOMC? So Michael Barr, who's the vice chair for supervision, has really extensive financial background. Um, I think we definitely still have a couple of Fed presidents who have been involved in financial markets to some extent and have, have some level of familiarity there. We have lost a lot of that in recent years. We have, we've kind of shifted more towards academia and more away from financial markets. For example, actually, the Fed had a major trading scandal last year, yeah. um, and three of the people who were ousted in the trading scandal because they had in some way, they, there would be some, I should say, the people who are suspected to have left because of the trading scandal 
but some of whom resigned for other purported reasons. Um, those people had backgrounds in financial markets. Right. Um, the people who traded in financial markets also had backgrounds in financial markets. And so I think we haven't really replaced them with that kind of, with those people. Although that's actually not a completely fair statement about the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, where we have hired Lori Logan, who was por formerly the uh, system open market account manager at the New York Fed, as the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas president. She's very experienced in financial markets. And there's an opening at Kansas City, as I understand it. There is an opening at Kansas City. We still don't know who's going there. So. Okay. Um, well, we're getting to the end, so let me turn to the obvious local questions. Um, so you did your MBA at Stern, and I'm just wondering, how, does that affect, how has it affected you in terms of your role as an economic and financial journalist and as a Fed watcher? Yeah, so it was really lucky that I did my econ or, or did my MBA here because in 2019, when the repo market blew up, which I previously mentioned, I would have been completely out of luck if I couldn't call my finance, finance professors and ask them what was happening because it was very rapid and it was very confusing and it required some amount of academic understanding of how these markets operate to be able to report on it in any even like mildly coherent way. And I feel like our coverage was much better as a result of being able to call someone. Um, so that was useful. I was still in the middle of my program at the time, actually. Okay. Uh, I missed a bunch of classes, obviously. <laughs> Uh, I think you took better classes. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then I think again in 2020, you know, I just think having some sort of technical background and, and you know, obviously an MBA is a very broad overview of many of these issues, but it was useful to just even have that broad overview. I think it was pretty imperative from a content side of things perspective. Um, and so, yeah, so super, super valuable. So my last question. Um, you have Stern students and faculty in the audience. Um, any advice you would give to our current students, current faculty, future students, future faculty? Oh, that's a broad, that is a very broad <laughs> question. Um, I think that, you know, I think when you're studying, I think it's very valuable if you can find ways to sort of apply it quickly. Um, I found that the things that I really took away from Stern that I sort of use on a regular basis are things that I used on a regular basis while I was still here. Um, and I think it doesn't necessarily, I mean, obviously I'm a journalist, so that's easy to do because I can, I can decide what story I'm going to write in a way that, that sort of aligns with whatever I'm, I'm learning. Um, but I think that there are other ways to find that in your everyday life. You know, I think that whatever research you're working on, whatever sort of you're doing as extracurricular projects on campus. I think those things can, if you find some tiebacks, I think that could be really useful. Well, I hope you'll all join me in thanking Gina Smialik for this excellent chat. And Gina, we only, we only just want a commitment that you come back with your next book. <laughs> I will do that. Thank you very much.